The church family at Hills Chapel would like to thank you for joining us online for this service. We pray that it will be a blessing to you and help facilitate another step in your spiritual journey. But we also want you to know that watching online should in no way replace your regular attendance to the church where God has called you to serve. If you do not regularly attend services, we would like to invite you to join us as we continue our journey to becoming more like Christ.
quick band throw together here this morning. And um, for those of you that don't know, Sydney is a lady of many talents. She started playing the piano about, what, five days ago? Five days ago, so we a good job this morning. Let's, uh, let's take a prayer request this morning and then we'll open our service in prayer and uh, let's just let the Lord have his way here this morning. So who'd be first this morning with a prayer request? That young gentleman right there has got his hand. I'm sorry? Yes. 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 We yes. visited with her yesterday and she seems to be doing pretty well. Okay. Um, She's going to see Taylor graduate him this week. So keep all of them. Gina's going down and Julie and Anita. She's feeling well enough. She's hoping that her love is safe so she can go. She has an appointment tomorrow to make sure that she can go. Good. Amen. Somebody else. Um, Mike has the bronchitis, asthma. He just got it a few days ago. I thought he was going to get by this year. He usually gets it every year. He coughs, coughs, coughs. Well, man, he's in the and she's got this. She does. He'll cough for months, but hopefully it won't be as bad. He's going to try to end the doctor anymore. Hopefully they'll get it before it gets too bad. And also, Mike's brother, Jeff, he's home now. You know, he's, he's the one that has a major depression and all. He's a little bit better, but he still needs our prayers. Got a neighbor across the road from my house that uh, diagnosed with phase three B lung cancer. She's on the other side. I was there with yesterday. Tell them we're going to be praying for her. Yeah. This week is going to be rough. Got stuff to work in his house. Got tired of talking to him. I asked him about his wife and going to church with him, but she won't go. He said, Well, I didn't know this. He said, I tried to get my boy to go. They tell me there ain't no such thing as heaven or hell. He said, Love me, they don't believe. They're going to be hell for me. I need strength to show them. I call my wife don't understand why I do what I do. Why I help everybody and do the things I do. And yesterday I was going the whole day helping different people. I was at my brother's unloading the trailer for his metal and stuff that we're going to do. And he told me all this and my little nephew come out and got this book. with us. Can you pray for her healing? Anybody else this morning? And I say it every week, but we got kids at school that are that are hurt. Um, just think things aren't slowing down in my office and uh, now, honestly, it's, it's kids dealing with serious things. Um, it's not just somebody doesn't like me, my friends are mad at me kind of stuff. And um, it's just it's just not getting easier. So um, let's remember those young people that are here and that aren't here. All right, Kevin, you come on and pray for the service and then school west. Let's pray. God, we just thank you for this morning. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity just to be in your house this morning. And we ask that you be at these prayer requests, Lord. Uh, be with Anita and uh, her healing, Lord, whatever that may look like. And you know how to direct that. And you know how to comfort her and care for her. We just ask that you continue to be with her. 
be with Mike uh, as he's feeling sick as well, Lord, and take care of him and his brother Jeff. Uh, you know the many needs that Jeff has, Lord, and we just ask that you be there and comfort him and just strengthen him and uh, clear his mind for a little bit so he can get some relief. And ask that you be with uh, the other prayer requests this morning and and uh, just uh, witnessing to those that don't know you from the family that was mentioned. And, and uh, we just ask that you be with the students and at the school, all the schools of Lord. And, just continue to watch over our church family, our friends, and those that we don't even know that need you, Lord. And we thank you for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we pray. We've asked God to enter into the service here and be with us this morning. And uh, whether we've had a good week, a bad week, or an indifferent week, uh, let's do our part this morning to praise Him. So who'd be first with a song or a testimony?
Because it's super difficult. I mean, I'm a, it shouldn't be as hard as some of the other ones I've been. But the reason it scares me is that the other stuff, if you haven't applied the other things, I'm going to be honest, this morning's message doesn't really apply to you. You can take it for education, you can mark it up, but if you are not living those things that we've already talked about, don't think that this morning, like, oh, I can skip steps, and hopefully we'll get into that. So I want to review uh, just quickly. Um, and then uh, we'll get into the message. Week one, we proved that God does have a will for our lives and it's not hidden. Uh, that we can know what His will is. Week two, we discovered uh, God wants each of us to be saved. Um, and that that salvation is the ultimate 
and most important part. Week three, we discovered uh, when we are saved, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in our lives, but that's not the end. God wants us to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and the example that we used in that was a hand and a glove. Week four, we discovered God's will. It's God's will that we be sanctified, which means that we be made pure. The example there was the plates with the eggs on, if you remember it. Why would we expect a holy God to hold us or accept a standard lower than what we expect or accept from other people? Week five, we discovered that it's God's will that we submit, uh, which means that we yield to the authority of or to the surrender or surrender uh, to the will of other people. Week six, we found out that it is God's will that we have a servant's heart. Not a list of things we do, but rather the right motivation for why we're doing it. Last week we discovered it's God's will that we suffer. And uh, I appreciate some of the conversations and comments that we've had back and forth this week about that. Not because He enjoys watching us suffer, but rather no spiritual suffering is much like us dieting or getting on an elliptical machine, which is the suffering is real. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> But it helps us grow, become healthier, um, and, and, and causes us to uh, gain strength. The information that I've shared in this series changed my life. And several years ago, uh, well, for several years I was constantly wondering what God's will was for my life. I, I was like, I don't know what he wants me to do. I didn't want to preach. I knew that for sure. And then I didn't think pastoring was an option because I didn't want to preach. So I thought I was off the hook there. But I went through life and I was like, what does God want me to do? Um, for a while, I believed that that was hidden, that his will was hidden from me, and that I had to strive for it. The problem is, is as I was looking for it, I never really knew if I found it or not, because there was always this question. And then when I thought I did find it, there was still a question, am I sure? Then I began to study God's word for myself, and that, that's why it is so important that you read scripture. What I began to discover as I studied God's Word was that He does. One well, of the things I've been sharing with you, that He does reveal His will, that He does want us to be saved, and, and all the other things. But then guess what? I began to question whether or not I was right in what I studied. And I found this little book that was written the same year I was born, uh, that I've been sharing some of the thoughts um, in this series, and it re- it, basically confirmed my own personal study, and I am so thankful for that. In fact, I have recommended that book to many, many people, and uh, they've had the same results. So this morning's message will be the final message in the series, and some of you probably are going, phew, I know I am. Uh, but I'll be honest, like I said, I've really struggled um, with it because it could be so easily misunderstood. You cannot apply the message directly to your life if you haven't marked up to the other things. And I encourage you, uh, come and talk to me. Get someone, if you are struggling in one of those areas, grab someone who will hold you accountable, who will love on you and encourage you so that you can get to this place. You know, it's really dangerous if we know parts of God's will and we ignore some and then do others. You know, if you, and Charlie is like the ultimate furniture assembler, uh, he's pretty much, if any furniture has to be put together at work, call Charlie, because Charlie follows instructions. But the rest of us think that we know better, right? We think that whoever designed a piece of paper and, and spent all kinds of time drawing it up on a computer probably doesn't understand how that thing goes together nearly as well as we do. So we'll just do it, and then what happens? We have, inevitably for me, a part left over. That means I have to disassemble it, put the part in, and then put it back together the way the picture showed to begin with. I had a professor in college uh, that said this quite often. Hook it up the way the picture shows, not the way you think it goes. 
And what I found out is when I would hook it up the way I thought it went, a lot of times it was in electrical classes, the smoke came out. And when the smoke comes out, they're not good anymore. So I have a little demonstration. And uh, so I'm going to have, let's see, Kevin and Dave and Tim. We'll call them the Three Stooges coming up. And uh, I'll have one of them stand here, one stand there, and one stand over there facing them. Uh, no, facing them. All right. So I have a goal that I want them to be, or to get to. All three of them to get to, okay? But my goal, uh, and it's much like God. He wants us to have a relationship with Him. He wants us to reflect Him to the world, and He wants us to get to heaven. That's His goals for our lives. That my goal for them is not quite as complex as that. But what I want them to do is, Kevin, I want you to ignore the first instructions. Uh, Tim, I want you to follow all the instructions. And Dave, I want you to ignore the third instruction. Okay? I scoot over that way a little bit. Okay. So you ready? All right. I want you to turn. No, just turn around. <laughs> Face, face the congregation. All right. Now I want you to walk until you hit an object. <laughs> now I want you to turn left. Walk until you hit an object. Baby, oh, you're already missing an object. <laughs> Third instruction you said for me. Yeah, you know? that's right. You were following the instructions. Good job. Now I want you to turn right. Walk until you hit an object. Turn right again. <laughs> you're trying. Right, we'll give you that. Go down the stairs. Tim, you don't have to go downstairs for real, but... Okay, so if he's standing there, to Tim, the next step makes perfect sense. But to the rest of them, it doesn't make sense at all. Why? Because there's no steps to go down. Okay, you guys can be seated. The picture of this is, listen, if you are not saved and you try to be filled with the Holy Spirit, it doesn't make sense. If you're saved and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, but you try to submit or you try to live a pure life, it doesn't make sense. So what you have to understand is we have to follow God's instructions to the T when, when He tells us to do it, or the next part um, in His plan doesn't make sense. And so this morning, with that in mind, I want you to keep this in mind, but <clears throat> is part, the last part of this series is if you're doing the things that I've already shared, you're living God's will, now it's time for you to do what you want. If you're doing all those other things, you are God's will, are living in God's will, so you can do what you want. Now, before you start singing a hallelujah chorus, <laughs> thinking, woohoo, this church is going to explode because the pastor is telling everyone they can do what they want. Understand this. If you're doing those principles, what is God in your life? God is. And if God is in control of your life, He is also in control of your desires. And if He's in control of your desires, He changes what you want. So you have to understand that. See, if you just take that part, like a lot of people do in Scripture, and says, oh, I can take this excerpt out of Scripture and it applies to every aspect of our life, but they ignore the rest of the Scripture. They're about as lost as Kevin and Dave was trying to go down steps when there's no steps. So God changes what you want. The, the passage I want to share with you this morning is Psalm 37, 4. Psalm 37, 4, it says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He shall give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He shall give you the desires of your heart. The New Living Translation, and that says, Take delight in the Lord, and He will give you your heart's desires. <laughs> this is a well-known verse that is quoted often. It's on shirts, it's on wall plaques and pictures and all kinds of things. Unfortunately, this passage is often used to misrepresent God as a genie in the bottle. 
If you rub the bottle just the right way, He'll come out. If you say a prayer a certain way, He will do certain things for you. If you make certain sacrifices through the week, He will give you what you want. If you turn on TV and listen to very many TV evangelists, they will tell you that if you plant a seed in their ministry of $1,000 or whatever it is, He's going to bless you beyond measure. You want to do that, that's fine. But it's not Scripture. They're taking a part of Scripture and they're blending it out. You know why? For their own benefit so that you're planting money in their pockets. Many share the promise God will give you the desires of your heart without ever mentioning the need to delight oneself in the Lord. They say, oh, God will give you whatever you want. They tell people to come to Christ and He'll give them whatever they want. No, that is not what Scripture says. It says that we must delight ourselves in the Lord. And if we do that, He gives us the desires of our heart. Why is that? Because He changes the desires of our heart. If you were to do a word study on delight here, it's not the same interpretation as what we may define the, uh, delight as. It actually means to be soft or pliable. Think about that for a minute. If you're soft or pliable with God, He shall give you the desires of your heart. When we are soft and pliable, we experience great pleasure and joy in just being in the presence of God. When you're completely committed to Christ following Him, He will give you the desires of your heart. Why? Because He becomes the desire of your heart. When you're completely committed to God, He becomes the desire of your heart. Your primary objective is to experience more of Christ, whatever it costs. If you're around me very much, you will know that I tell people that I'm an addict, that I'm addicted to Christ. I'm addicted to Him flowing through me. The, the definition of addiction is a strong inclination to do, use, or indulge in something repeatedly. We should all be addicted to Christ. If we are doing all those other things, guess what? He is our heart's desire, and we should be able to meet that definition as being addicted to Him and Listen, if you're around an addict, every single thing that they want is focused on their next fix. So every single action, every single thought, every part of our life is, is this drawing me closer to God? And if you are there, guess what? You can do whatever you want because whatever you want is what's drawing you or the things you want is what's drawing you to Him. So Jonathan, I would love a closer relationship with Christ, but I just can't right now. My question for you is, why not? What is holding you back? What thing is that? Every one of us finds times and makes sacrifices to the things that are important in our life. Every one of us. You can go through life and say, well, you know, I really want to lose weight. Quit eating ho-hos. I mean, being committed in that, if you really, really want it, the thing that you want the most is what you will do. So if you want to lose weight, quit eating. But what happens? We love that more than we love losing weight. And I'm guilty of that. This week I made it to the gym every day. But I've also ate ice cream most of those days as well. So there's not a lot of improvement in that. Why? Because my commitment to the gym or to being healthy is less than my commitment or love for ice cream. So you say, well, I love God. I don't understand what the problem is. Here's a brief quiz that tells you what is important in your life. Where do you spend your time? Look at your calendar and tell me where you spend your time. If you say, well, you know, John, then I know God's Word and reading God's Word is important. And I know having family devotions is important. And I know that prayer time is important. But you just don't understand. I don't have time. Here's a challenge for you this week. On your phone, your smartphone, the 90% of them have, there's a little thing that will tell you how much screen time that you have. If you have seven hours of screen time on your phone, don't give me the baloney that you don't have time to study and read. That's important. 
So apparently social media, and for me this week it's been trying to learn how to play Catan, or Catan so I can beat all the rest of you that are playing that. <laughs> but if I put that over my love for God and my willingness to be close to Him, guess what? I'm not going to be. The next thing, where do you spend your money? Oh, we love talking about our finances, don't we? Look at your checkbook. Look at your bank account. Look at your credit card. You're just like, well, I know where my uh, checkbook is going. It's paying for my credit card. Well, look at that thing. Where are you spending your money? Are you investing in the kingdom? What do you think about? What do you talk about? What is absorbing your thought process? What we watch, what we listen to, who we talk to, those things have a big impact on our thought process. You know what? This is what I found. There are people that I work with, I don't have any problems with them. In fact, I love them. But I know my conversation with them is not going to draw me closer to God. And when we decide who's going to lunch with who, I want to go with the people who we're going to have a meaningful conversation about our Savior. If you're talking about everyone else, and I'm not talking about talking about the people in the church, I'm talking about talking about the God of the church, then if that's not the case, then you probably have a misplaced priority in that. If knowing and responding to God's will is the priority in your life, you're willing and ready to do whatever it takes to draw closer to Him or to have the opportunity to represent Him to someone else. Think about what happens when you take an interest or want to be part of something. Now, we have some uh, basketball players here this morning that are friends with my son. And uh, I got to watch most of them. Uh, oh, wait a minute. One of them was on the basketball team. He was on the basketball team last year. But we all have been to some type of event this year. And imagine some of you are coaches and your basketball team, I'm one of your basketball players. Now trust me, if I'm one of your basketball players, I'm going to be what they call on the deep end of the bench, okay? Because like everyone has to have broken legs and been wheeled out on a gurney before I'm able to play, okay? But I'm sitting there on the bench and I'm like <clears throat> watching the game. Oh, my phone's over there. I get out my phone and I'm playing Catan, or Catan so I can beat Kevin next time. And... Uh, then I start yawning, leaning back on the bench, and eventually I'm like, hey coach, you know, if you need me, let me know, but you're going to have to talk really loud and really clear because I'm getting ready to take a nap. And then I sit down on the benches and I lay down and go to sleep. What are the chances that you think that he would ever put me into the game? None. Why? Because I am not showing any interest in that. But if I am engaged in the game, if I am watching him or watching what's going on, if I'm listening to what he's saying, if I'm the first one to the huddle or when they group up and all those things, there is a better chance that he is going to put me in. Why? Because I'm willing and I'm ready. There's a lot of people that say, oh, we want to be close to God. We want to know what His will is. But they're sitting there doing all these other things, allowing every other thing to distract them. Or they're perfectly comfortable sitting on the couch or on other parts of their body um, and relaxing or sleeping and saying, well, you know, when God tells me what He wants me to do, you're going to have to tell me really clear, like write it on the wall or something. But I, I'm a willing vessel. You were the coach and I was doing that. There's not a chance. You just forfeit the game. It's like, why put him out there? Which one represents you and your desire for God? Are you sitting there waiting and willing, saying, Coach, put me in. Put me in. I know I may not be as good as that person, but I will play with more heart than they ever have. Just put me in. Consider the life of the Apostle Paul in that. Paul was one of those people, Dave, that was like, put me in. 
It doesn't make a difference. See, Paul willingly went from a power-hungry religious leader who thought he had it all together with a lot of prestige in his people to an evangelist who was regularly ridiculed and beaten and sometimes even left for dead. Why would he do this? Paul's goal in life and his desires changed. He no longer wanted people to recognize him. He didn't care about what people thought or the, the level that he had as a Pharisee. Uh, when Paul compared what he was going through, um, he desired to be with Christ. And when he compared the, the things that he was going through, that we were like, oh my goodness, I would never want to have to go through that. I can't imagine why he would keep going. This is what he said. When he, when he compared those things with the hope of eternity, he said it wasn't even close. In fact, he said this, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He's like, if I am alive, if there is breath in my lungs that we just sang about, if there is my heart is beating, the purpose of those things, the purpose of my heart beating, the purpose of my breath is for Christ. And listen, if I die, my reward, my being with him is even better. It's gain. So he's like, while I'm here, I'm going to do everything I have uh, so that he will be here with me so that I can uh, feel his presence. But when that ends, it's so much better. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, this is Paul writing as well. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. What was he talking about? Our old way of life, which also means our heart. What happens when we do those things? Christ changes our heart, our, the desires of our heart. And what does that become? To be more like Him and to be in His presence. Paul's entire life was transformed from persecuting Christians and killing their message to loving God and serving Him regardless of the cost. Because Paul became a new person, he was ready and willing to do whatever God asked him to do. See, Paul was saved. He was filled with the Spirit. He was submissive. He had a servant's heart. And he definitely suffered. Did Paul give up? Absolutely not. He was ready to move for God. He was, put me in, coach. Let me know. God, put me to work. Tell me the next place to go. Tell me the next opportunity to serve. Tell me the next thing that I can do for you and for your kingdom. Why? Because he looked back at his old self and he was in love with God who changed him, who gave him that new heart. We miss a ton of opportunities simply because we have either misplaced priorities or we're unwilling or not ready to go in for God. We're still sitting on the end of the bench, playing with whatever, distracted by whatever, or we're asleep at the end of the bench saying, God, I'm here. I'm a willing vessel. You just have to shake me and wake me up and draw me a picture and then I'll do it. We also miss opportunities when we're unwilling to move and constantly second guess God's will. We're just sitting and waiting. If we are fully committed and submitted to God, we should be moving and ready to go. You know, we often refer to doors of opportunity either opening or closing. When the truth is, a lot of times we're sitting on our proverbial couch surrounded by doors and we won't even get up to check and see if they're locked. Like, oh, if a door opens, I'm waiting for my next door of opportunity. There's doors surrounding you that are unlocked. How many of you have waited for someone to bring you a key and you never even checked the door to see if it was unlocked? I know one time my dad went as a locksmith to unlock a person's car who locked her keys in the car. And guess what? The car wasn't locked. <laughs> And we do the same thing with God. We're like, He's planted doors of opportunity all the way around us and we're just sitting, waiting for Him to come and open us and will us through one and all we'll willingly serve Him once we get through it. But maybe we need to be checking the doors. If you're in a place you don't want to be or you've got someplace else you want to go, you're trying to see how you're going to get out of that particular situation. And trust me, I'm pretty sure we're probably going to check the doors. Yeah. 
Paul wasn't laying on the couch or sitting saying, God, if you want to me to do something, wake me up, make it really clear, and I'll do it. He was much like Isaiah uh, when God spoke to him, and he was like, here I am, send me. Think about Paul's second missionary journey. He had already fulfilled a uh, ministry that God had planned for Galatia, which was a large area in the Roman uh, Empire. He got done with it, and, and the Bible tells us that he had successfully strengthened, encouraged, and confirmed the saints. Think about that. The Bible said in this large portion of the Roman Empire that he had strengthened, encouraged, and confirmed the saints. So Paul said, oh, I'm going to go to the beach. I'm done with my ministry. I'm finished. No, that's not what he said. Paul kept moving. There was another door and he went and checked it. The first one was he went headed west without knowing God's specific will. But he was moving. You know why? It was the door that was unlocked. He didn't know where that door was taking him, but he was like, this is my way. If God doesn't want me there, he'll send me back another way. Um, so he decided, he started going west, headed towards Asia Minor. But God closed the door. Acts 16.6 6 tells us that. So Paul decided to stop and just wait for the next instruction. Nope. He started checking all the other doors. And he found another one. His entire party started headed toward my shed. But verse 7 tells us that God closed the door there too. Paul could have given up and said, apparently God is done with me. He doesn't need me right now. I'm going to sit back and relax. Nope. He started checking the doors and there was another opportunity. So he started headed or started towards true act. And guess what? In Troas, he received his next instruction that came as a vision that said, listen, come over to Macedonia. So Paul said, okay, I'm willing to go to Macedonia. Send me a boat and someone who's going to drive me and make sure that I'm safe and all those different things and I'll go. No, it says immediately they started looking for a way to get to Macedonia. Immediately, it said, we sought to go to Macedonia. Why? Because he knew that that's where God wanted it to be. And he knew at that place was where he was going to fill God's presence and be able to represent God to others. And so he started seeking a way to get there. Over the last several weeks, maybe... You came hoping that I would tell you what job you needed to take, what ministry uh, to start, what person to marry, or school to attend. The truth, the truth is, I don't know. But what I do know is if you are doing all the principles that we have covered over the last several weeks, this morning I'm telling you to take the next step in the direction that you want to go. And see what happens. God will either open the door or He will close the door. But guess what? His will is not hidden. And if you are moving, He will reveal His will. Far too many people sit around waiting for God to show them the next step when the truth is God is waiting for them to have the faith to step out. Many of you know Destiny's story, and I'm not going to go through a lot of that, but Destiny made a lot of mistakes. In fact, some of us, while praying for her, had some conversations, and there were a few of us uh, that were like, we don't know what else to do other than just pray for her. She's not listening. She's avoiding us. You know, right, Sydney? You go to try to talk to her, and pew, she is gone. Like, that girl should have ran track as fast as she could get away from her. But we were faithful and we prayed. She went back to camp. During camp, she began to grow. During that time, she was planning on going to college. Guess what? During that time, God laid on her heart, or at least she thought he did, a door opened um, in the form of Mickey Bain's daughter. And she was like, you know what? I think I'm going to go to the Dominican Republic. I think that's where God wants me to go. So what do we do? We design shirts, or did you design this shirt, Ben? Ben designed the shirt, Destiny to the DR, or whatever it said. And we started selling them and raising money. And guess what? Destiny went to Costa Rica. You know why? 
Because God shut the door for Dominican. But she didn't say, well, I don't guess that's God's will, so I'm going to go somewhere, back to school or sit at home and whine and cry and do whatever. No. She went there with the idea that her lifelong passion, which was soccer, was going, she was going to help kids with a soccer ministry. And that was her desire. While we were down there, we were talking and she said, you know what, I love soccer and I don't want to take away from that. And if God will allow me to use soccer, I'm perfectly fine with that. But that's not my focus anymore. She didn't know what I had been studying and what I was going to be sharing this morning. She said, my focus is I want to disciple kids. And if God allows soccer to be a part of that, I'm perfectly fine with that. But listen, I have a bad knee. And now I realize that if I do that, I probably are going to be crippled. And so I don't really care about that. I just want to lead people to Christ and disciple young people who are hurting. What happened? She's doing her desire, but her desire changed. Why? Because she was willing to move. I'm not telling you have to go to... Uh, Costa Rica or Dominican Republic, I hope you don't have to go there. Why? Because I love you. I want you here. Another example sitting right here. Two young people. Our worship team is gone for the next three months. She learned how to play a piano this week so that she could do that. And some of you are sitting back there saying, well, she doesn't play as well as Brett. You learn this week and you can try it, okay? But she was willing to move. She sent me a message, what, Monday? Hey, can you have Abby start practicing? I didn't know she knew how to play a piano. And I think I even asked her that. She's like, oh, I didn't. I just taught myself. <laughs> what? That's being willing to move. And when you move and God reveals His will to you, guess what? That's the desires of your heart. When you're doing that, you have a feeling of completion and a kinship with Christ, which is what we should be addicted to. Some of you are like, man, it's been a while since I've done that. Start moving. It makes a difference. As God moved her, as God moves us, our desires change. 20 years ago, I had a portfolio goal that I wanted at the age of 40. I have not met that goal. Even close. But you know what? I'm where I want to be. You know why? Because I don't care about that. Because the word that I follow says, lay not up for yourselves treasures here on earth where moth and rust corrupt or thieves break in and steal, but lay up yourself for yourselves treasures in heaven where those things don't happen. My, my desires change. My things change. And in that, I'm perfectly content. I don't have to worry about the things I have or I don't have. You say, well, you have more than I do. Well, maybe if you would have started following God and doing everything, you'd be there too. I don't know. I'm not the pastors that's preaching that. God's will may include you going down a difficult path, but if you allow Him to direct your steps, it will turn out well. Think of the times that you have, have went to rest homes. Listen, rest homes smell, right? I'm the only one that thinks they smell. You walk in and they smell. And you go, and a lot of times you have other things that you would rather do because you're not for sure if it's going to be any benefit or not. But you go hoping that you're going to be a blessing to someone. Every time you go, I challenge you with this, when you walk out, who's the one that got blessed? You are. The first time I ever shared a message was at Edgewood Manor. And I had four people in, that were sitting in there, and all four of them resembled this. <laughs> Try preaching your first message where the only person paying attention is your pastor who made you go and do it. And I was sitting there, and the enemy was like, well, this is a good start of your uh, ministry career. They won't, won't even wake up to hear any of it. Let alone have opportunity for you to put them back to sleep. And I'm sitting there, and while I'm trying to share God's word, there was this internal struggle that was going on. So I turned it over to George when I was done, and he started playing the guitar. Well, what I didn't know is where he was sitting, he could see the nurse who was sitting on the other side who came in and gave her heart to God. 
Now, I went there thinking I was serving, but guess what? I walked out realizing that I had been served. So many times we do that. And, and I know uh, Sydney's youth group, they go to uh, the children's home. You guys still do that? You yeah, have? But you did go out there. You got there thinking, well, I'm going to go be a blessing to these kids. And when you walk out, guess what? Your desires has changed and you've realized that you were there. You were representing God and that was a blessing. Same is true with Star. Some of you, we had to work for years to get you to go to Emmaus. But you finally went. Some of you. Some of you were still trying. Which there's walks coming up. But you walked out of there. Guess what? You were blessed. Why? Because your desires changed. Those three days that you had to sacrifice and the things you had to give up no longer meant as much. Why? Because you had spent 72 hours in the presence of God. Tell me a time when serving God didn't pay off. Tell me a time when following His, His will and doing what He told you when He told you didn't pay off. When we serve God, He gives us life. In fact, the Scripture says that He came that we may have life and that we may have it more abundantly. We're not sacrificing our life. We are trading in our broken, messed up wreck and He is giving us abundant life in replacement for that. Romans 8, verses 5-6 through 6, share some of this. It says this, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Minds and heart can be used interchangeably here. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. I'll read that out of New Living. It says, Those who are dominated by their sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Listen, when you do the things that we've already talked about, life and peace is happening. Your desires change. And guess what? You don't want to do anything that will remove that life and peace that you regularly experience. If you're following the principles um, in this series that we're wrapping up, there is a decision before you right now. My suggestion to you is take the next step in the direction that you want to go. Take the next step that inevitably you know is right. If you have came to talk to me about ministry in the church, and you say, hey, I think we should start this. What's my words? Go ahead. <clears throat> Try it. A lot of people say, well, you know, I'm interested in teaching Sunday school, but I don't know which one. Well, guess what? You're not going to know while you're sitting in, some, in the Sunday school class that you've always been in. Start going to the Sunday school classes. Learn where you fit. Learn what works. You say, well, I don't know all the scripture. Here's a news flash for you. Neither do I. Okay. But if you're moving, God will open the doors. He will provide for you the wisdom that you need for the calling that He has placed on you. Maybe you're here this morning and you're like, Jonathan, I haven't felt God's direction ever. Or maybe, Jonathan, I haven't felt God's direction for a long time. My question for you is, how willing are you to respond to His directions? How willing have you been and responsive have, have you been to his directions in the past? Maybe you haven't followed his directions for so long you don't know what his directions are. My thing is, is why don't you have a conversation with him and say, God, what is my next steps? I want the fire back inside. I want the desire back inside. I want the purpose of life back in me. I want to know where I'm going. If you know me, I'm not a big person when I'm traveling to look up directions if I have someone else to follow. 
I was on the airplane flying to Costa Rica, and the guy that was sitting next to me said, hey, where, what part of Costa Rica are you going to? And I said, I don't know. And he looked at me kind of funny, and he was like, what? And I was like, the guy back in 26B is the one that scheduled this, so I don't really know where I'm going. And I looked at my ticket on my phone, and I was like, oh, San Jose. And he's like, oh, I know where that's at. And I was like, and he looked at me like, what in the world are you doing? If I go hiking with Tim, I have no clue where we're going. And sometimes I have no idea where we've been. I have to call him and say, hey, you know the rock that was big and smooth that looked like my bald head? What was that called? It was half done. But I don't know those things. You know why? Because I have someone who is leading me and that I trust. And as long as they're in front of me, I don't worry about where I have to go or what I have to do. That is knowledge and stress that I don't have to deal with. And the same exact thing is true in our spiritual lives. If we are completely committed. Now, I know that I have to keep sight of Tim if he's the one that's leading. Because if not, I have no clue where I am or where I'm supposed to be. And the same is true with God. If you recognize and quit worrying about trying to figure out where you're at and where you're supposed to be. And you're just following Him. That's your desire is to be behind Him. Amen. So if you don't know what that next step looks like, as we have an invitation this morning, I challenge you to come and talk to Him and say, what is my next step? He doesn't need a bench full of people who are distracted and laying down and saying, listen, if you come and uh, paint me a picture, I will do it. He needs a group of people who are sitting there saying, put me in, put me in. When can I represent you? When can I be the light that you have called me to be? This morning I want to ask you to stand if you would. Why don't you take the next step in the direction you believe is best and see what doors He opens and which ones, which ones He closes. He's speaking to you this morning. Will you respond? Will you take the next step? This is my turn.